Welcome to Sustainability Now, an exploration of technologies and paradigms to shape a world that works. Designed for socially conscious entrepreneurs and individuals interested in responsible stewardship of the planet. Sustainability Now covers food, energy, housing, water, waste, health, economics, and consciousness. Welcome to your community, Sustainability Now, with your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome, everybody, to Sustainability Now, Technologies and Paradigms to Shape a World that Works. I'm very excited to introduce you today to Paul Shapiro. Innovator, entrepreneur, and visionary, Paul is changing the world. He started his company, The Better Meat Company, in 2018 with a mission to build a more sustainable food system by replacing meat from animals with a next-generation plant-based mycoprotein superfood. Paul is a four-time TEDx speaker, and his book, Clean Meat, How Growing Meat Without Animals Will Revolutionize Dinner and the World, is a national bestseller. His podcast, Business for Good, highlights entrepreneurs who use their businesses to solve the world's most pressing problems. Paul, I'm really delighted to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for being here. Great to be with you, Mira. Thanks so much for having me. Well, so you are so accomplished in in many arenas. Um, in our in our uh, earlier conversation, I learned that you've been pretty much of an activist from the time you were in your early teens, and um, you have you're not. It doesn't look like there's any sign of you quitting anytime soon. So, um, I'm I you've kind of pushed all my buttons in a really good way. Uh, the podcast that you have highlighting people solving the world's problems through business. This is one of our themes too, is to also be working with visionary entrepreneurs and looking at how to solve these, these world issues. Um, you're right on it. So tell us, tell us, because you have been in the sustainability arena in one way or another since you were a kid. You want to just sort of give us a little background on how you got started and and why, how you migrated to Better Meat. <laughs> it's been a, quite a journey, Mira. Uh, but, you know, when I was a kid, like a lot of kids, I really loved animals. And I certainly viewed my family's pets, like we had dogs. Um, I know you have a, a little bird, Maggie, who's very cute, but we didn't have birds. So I didn't really know much about them. I did know, however, dogs. And you know, my dogs were like my brothers and sisters to me. In fact, I would say that maybe at times I loved them more than my biological uh, uh, sibling. I don't know. But the point is that I loved animals. And when I was 13, a friend of mine showed me what happens to them. He had like a, he had a video of um, what happens to them in slaughterhouses and factory farms. And you know, keep in mind, this is like, you know, 1993, right? There's no internet, no YouTube, like a video back then meant a VHS tape. And for those of your listeners who are too young to know what that means, it's like a rectangular piece of plastic that you used to put inside <laughs> of a box. And then it showed you a video. It was like the OG of YouTube. So anyway, he wasn't showing me this as like a evangelical, right? He was showing it to me as just something that he thought was, you know, like insane. You know, he's like, dude, this is sick. You got to see it. Uh, but when I watched it, I thought, what would I do if those were my dogs? And I knew there's nothing I wouldn't have done to prevent that type of a cruel fate from befalling my dogs. And so I became a vegetarian. And one thing led to another. And I became very interested in issues surrounding how we feed ourselves, because not only is the current method of meat production extremely inhumane to animals, but it's also just really inefficient and bad for the planet. So it's no longer any secret that it just takes a lot of land, a lot of water, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions to produce meat from animals, um, way more than if you eat protein from plants. And so when you consider the fact that there's nearly 8 billion of us walking around the planet now, and within the next 30 years, barring any catastrophe, there's going to be probably about 10 billion of us. You're always like, we can't keep feeding ourselves the way that we do. Um, it's just not going to work. We don't have any other celestial bodies to farm. We're not going to be farming the moon. We're not going to be farming Mars. We have one planet and the planet is just 
it's not getting any bigger. Humanity's footprint on the planet is getting a lot bigger, but the planet itself is not getting any bigger at all. And a huge part of that footprint is our food print, principally in the amount of meat that we eat. So I became very concerned about this. And for a long time, Mira, I believed that facts would be sufficient, that merely telling people these types of facts would actually change their behavior. But then I uh, later learned that Actually, facts are not what change people's behavior for the most part. Normally, people change for uh, for my, many other reasons, but facts or facts and evidence are generally not them. And I, I came to believe that food technology was the answer, in in or is an answer, not the only answer, but an answer to this problem. And so, in the same way, you know, if you think about, I don't know, let's say clean energy, like some people think let's just get people not to drive, right? Just make people walk and bike and that'll be great. That's kind of like saying to people, well, just become vegan, you know, like just stop eating meat and, and eggs and dairy. And I think it's awesome for people not to drive. I think it's awesome for people not to eat meat. Um, but most people aren't going to do that. Sadly, I, I wish that we were different, but most people aren't going to do it. And so that's why you need electric cars. That's why you need solar panels. That's why you need clean energy. And that's also why we need cleaner types of meat. And so I wrote this book, Clean Meat, how Growing Meat Without Animals Will Revolutionize Dinner in the World that explores the investors, the entrepreneurs, the scientists who are all racing to commercialize the world's first slaughter-free meat. So in the same way that we can have a car that doesn't rely necessarily on fossil fuels because it's electric and you, if you're getting your power from renewable sources and you can have a, you know, get yourself off of fossil fuels that way, we can still enjoy the meat-like experience but without needing to raise and slaughter animals. And so that's what I've devoted my life to, both chronicling the work of the people doing this and in the last few years, becoming one of the people who's doing this by starting my own company, The Better Meat Co. in this space. So that's a mouthful. <laughs> that is yeah. awesome. And you used a term I've never heard before, vegangelical. Oh, uh, yeah. Term. Did you coin that phrase? No, I have used it many times, but it is almost synonymous with vegan because most vegans I've learned are vegangelicals also. Um, and, uh, you know, I understand why. I have to ask you, are you vegan? Yeah, I became vegan at the same time that I became vegetarian. Um, I'm married to a vegan cookbook author. So uh, I wish that more people would see the world that I do uh, in the way that I do. Um, sadly, I've learned that they don't. <laughs> and uh, so we got to play the cards as they're dealt. And uh, I think, you know, I think a lot of people will be happy to eat less meat. But uh, overall, I think we, you know, in the same way that, you know, when you flick a light switch, you just want light, right? You, you just want the experience of an illuminated room. You're not thinking about whether it's coming from renewables or fossil fuels. Similarly, when you eat meat, most people aren't thinking, oh, did this come from a slaughtered animal? Did this come from uh, something else? Like, they're not thinking about that. They just want that experience that satisfies like their meat tooth, so to speak. And I think that we can provide that without needing to raise and slaughter animals. I am with you there. I, um, I actually became vegetarian for the first time when I was a teenager too, because cool. I had hatched a couple roost. I had hatched a couple chickens for Aww. a science fair experiment and they were my pets. Oh, how nice. And one time we were sitting at dinner and uh, my, my mom had cooked, chicken and everybody was spitting bones and i was like oh my god we're being cannibals you know it's like eating family you know so i think you know you say that facts don't change people but i think that an emotional response to facts yeah change, change behaviors yeah, emotions play a huge role in, in what we're doing. And, you know, oftentimes emotions and facts are, are quite different from one another. And I just mean like, you know, telling people animals are treated inhumanely or telling people that this is contributing to antibiotic resistance or greenhouse gas emissions. Most of the time it doesn't change behavior. Sometimes it might, but most of the time it doesn't. But when you have that emotional connection to an animal, in your case, to these chickens, it might make people think twice about wanting to eat chickens. The issue for us, I mean, you know, you look at Americans and, you know, almost universally we are repulsed by the idea of eating dogs yet in some other parts of the world where they are you know dog keeping is less prevalent they're not so repulsed by it 
uh, you know, for us, we say, you know, killing whales is almost murderous. Uh, whereas in other parts of the world, you know, killing whales is the same as fishing to them. And so, uh, you know, like people just have different experiences with different animals and they have different connections to them. And um, I wish that we viewed all animals the same and said, hey, you know, we should have a live and let live mentality uh, with regard to these other animals and try to uh, uh, try to engage in as much nonviolent behavior to them as possible. Uh, sadly, though, violence and domination is the way that we categorize or that we characterize nearly all of our relationships with animals, uh, from the animals we eat to animals we use for entertainment, to animals we wear, um, you know, for the most part, uh, you know, violence and domination is the relationship that humans have with the rest of the animal kingdom. Uh, there are some exceptions, but there are exceptions to the rule. And so I'm glad, though, that you, Mira, had this great experience with these chickens where you viewed them as pets rather than, you know, just as, uh, you know, walking drumsticks, so to speak. And I wish more people would have those type of experiences. So you definitely are a vegan evangelical, which I love. <laughs> and, and actually, that brings us to be talking about your TED Talks. So you have four TED Talks, TEDx Talks, which is really quite an accomplishment. One is an accomplishment. Four is crazy. And they are primarily about veganism, vegetarianism, our relationship to animals um, and food supply. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I, I appreciate that, Mira. So, yeah, there is a, a theme to them all, which is basically how we are treating animals as a negative impact on them, on us, on the planet and so on. Um, but I, I do believe that future generations are going to look back in, in revulsion at the ways in which we treated animals. And you know, it's so easy for us to look back on the misdeeds of our ancestors that we have been freed from. Like we don't you know, have a hard time condemning things that they were doing because we weren't dependent on them. But I believe that in the future, people are going to look back and wonder how could we ever have allowed ourselves to treat animals in the ways that we do, especially for food. So, you know, I do think though that it's possible to imagine the kind of world where our relationship with other animals is one that's based on compassion and respect. Um, you know, if you look, for example, just at, at how quickly societies change, you know, think about it from here, like, 150 years ago, if you had lived in America, the legitimate social debate at that time was whether one human ought to be able to own another human being as a piece of property. You know, you could hold either side of that view and be a legitimate member of society. You know, you could be a doctor, a lawyer, a you know, pastor, whatever, and hold either side of that. Whereas today, you know, imagine taking the wrong side on that and you would be a pariah if you said, actually, I believe in slavery you know, you would, you would lose your job, you would be ostracized from your family and friends. I mean, it would be immediate, you would just lose everything. Um, you know, even 100 years ago, the debate was whether half the population should even be able to vote. Um, you know, like you wouldn't have been able to vote like just a little over 100 years ago. And, you know, today, imagine if somebody in America said, Oh, no, I don't think women should be able to vote, like they would be completely in, in a tiny little minority. Um, you know, even 50 years ago in the 1960s or so, I guess let's think about uh, is that 60 years ago or so, but either way, uh, you know, about half a century ago, uh, the legitimate debate in America was whether one whites and blacks ought to be able to drink from the same drinking fountain. I mean, that was like actually a debate and respectable members of society held the view on each sides of that point. And of course, now it's so easy for us to say, oh, that's absurd. How could anybody believe in segregation or slavery or denying women the right to vote and so on? But those were real debates at that time. And I think in the future, they're going to look back on what we were doing to the planet and what we were doing to animals. And they will think of the debates that we were having, they'll think, how could anybody have defended this? How could anybody have said, oh, yeah, it's OK to keep animals in cages where they can't even turn around their whole lives? And that's a standard practice in, in some of these industries, like in the pork and egg industries, where animals are, are kept in cages where they either can't turn around or they can't spread their wings uh, for years, not, not just like weeks or months, but for years. And torturous. I just think, yeah, I, I agree. It is torturous. It's torturous. So, so I, you know, part of the theme of my uh, talks is that I, I really think that we can do better and we can help to build a more humane society, a one, a society in, in which our relationship with animals is based more on compassion and respect and where we don't just have a might makes right mentality that says, hey, we're stronger than they are so we can treat them however we want. 
Well, you said so many provocative things and I love it. And the thing that it came to mind to me as you were talking about uh, migrating from a culture of domination and violence or domination and control to one of compassionate kindness, that's what humanity needs to do to hum- for humanity as well. I right. mean, we have been a culture of domination and violence, and that is a, a standard paradigm um, from person to person. And we convey that to the, the way that we interact with uh, the planet, its resources, other life forms. It, 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 that's, it is a shifting paradigm. And I agree with you, the way that we treat animals, the way that we treat the soil, the, the land, um, the plants, the way that we interact with nature is really abominable. And, and I, I, I agree that it's all perspective. And you talked about the right to vote. And even now, we are embroiled in fights for the right to maintain the right to vote. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's remarkable. You would think that we would move past some of this stuff, but uh, I think that you're right. You know, human beings have not shown ourselves to be uh, reliably virtuous. <laughs> that is for sure. And um, I think it's imperative that we create systems in place that help to incentivize and make easier virtuous behavior. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's got to be uh, something that, you know, for example, you know, if you think about the cost of solar, well, it's come down a lot. And so, you know, in the past, there was a big barrier to solar because it was, it was a costly thing. But if you can make solar cheaper, all of a sudden, now the cost of, of being virtuous is actually less, right? Like there's not a punishment now. It might actually be beneficial for you to switch from fossil fuel to solar. And um, that's what my wife and I did when we realized, like, economically, it really made sense for us to put solar panels on our roof. And even somebody like me, who's deeply concerned about climate, hadn't done that yet. And, uh, you know, because there was the economic barrier. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so on the other side of that, we also, you, you know, we're, you're talking about kind of rewarding virtuous behavior and maybe on the other side, we get to not reward Mm non-virtuous behavior. So we get to stop subsidizing the fossil fuel industry, for example. Yes, that that would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. I think the same is so with meat too. You know, we've got, um, we've got enormous subsidies that go not just to fossil fuels, but also to animal agriculture. I did not know that. Yeah. So the number one, the number one cost of raising animals for food is their feed, corn and soy, basically. And it's highly subsidized. That, that system is a highly subsidized system of corn and soy. But it's not just the subsidies. It's also, you know, when these industries overproduce, uh, they have surplus buy-ups by the government who just comes in and buys. So they're not really subject to the same laws of uh, supply and demand, oftentimes even. Uh, most of the time, if you don't have enough buyers for your product, uh, you know, you, you end up contracting. Uh, however, the meat, egg, and dairy industries typically get the USDA to buy up surplus products of theirs for hundreds of millions of dollars and, you know, dump it into the school lunch system or the federal prison system or other places where the federal government uses, um, uh, uses animal products. So it's, uh, you know, there's that. And then there's also uh, lots of other supports in the form of R&D research subsidies. There's all types of other things. And then there's unpaid costs altogether, like environmental damage, public health consequences that don't get paid. Monocropping, uh, Monocropping yeah, so, um, pesticides. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, you know, like, you know, bottom line, though, like if you want to farm less land, if we want to take more land out of agriculture and put it back into the wild, we got to stop raising animals or at least reduce our reliance on animals because they take up huge amounts of land, not just the land they're standing on, but the land that we have to grow all that feed for them for. Um, so that is uh, one of the key reasons why I think it's so imperative to develop ways to deliver the meat experience to people without having to raise and slaughter animals. Beautiful. I, I agree with you a thousand percent. And that is a perfect segue into better meat. So how did you actually get into starting that company? And then I want to talk about what exactly it is. So sure. Well, you know, Mira, when I was writing the book, Queen Meat, one of the things that I, it dawned on me was that the people who are starting these companies that were raising lots of money in the space did not have like major entrepreneurial backgrounds. They weren't necessarily even scientists. They weren't people who had run other companies. They're just people who want to make a difference. And here they were succeeding, raising, you know, lots of money. 
from investors. And I, you know, I thought, well, what can I do to contribute to the space? And I was like, well, I'm not a scientist and I don't know anything about business. So uh, the best I could do was write a book. But as I was writing the book, it dawned on me, like these people have just as much reason to start a company as I do. Uh, so after the book came out, I did contemplate doing another book on the topic, uh, but then I decided that rather than writing about the people who I thought would save the world, I would just become one of them myself. And I decided to start the Better Meat Co., which is an ingredients company that uses fermentation to produce next generation mycoproteins. So if you think about like how right now plant-based meat is either made from wheat, pea, or soy, these are plants. Well, we, you know, if you think about like you've got animals and you've got plants and they're pretty far apart on the evolutionary tree. They're very different from one another. So you got to do a lot to get plants to taste like an animal's flesh. You have to uh, mill it, isolate it, fractionate it, uh, extrude it. There's all these processing steps that you need to do to get that, let's say, pea to taste like meat because anybody who's eaten peas knows that they don't have the texture or taste of meat. So you can do that. Lots of cool companies are um, making plants and turning them into things that look like animal meat. However, there's an entirely other kingdom. It's not just plants and animals. You've got fungi also. And fungi are not in between plants and animals, right? Again, you've got plants, you've got animals. Fungi are not right in between them. They are right next to animals. They're so much more like animals, in fact, that they breathe oxygen just like we do. You know, everybody knows plants breathe in CO2 and breathe out oxygen. Well, fungi, like animals, breathe in oxygen and they breathe out CO2. Uh, then also, unlike plants, they don't photosynthesize. Like mushrooms don't put themselves in the sun and collect their energy. They go out and find food and eat it just like, uh, just like animals do. So under the soil, they're growing around looking for food. Um, so you look at fungi and then all of a sudden it becomes very obvious that mushrooms have a much more meat-like texture than plants do. This is why mushrooms have been used as a meat substitute for, for uh, millennia in um, Asian cuisine. Well, Mushrooms have a much more meat-like texture because they're so much closer to animals. And that is what we are doing at the Better Meat Co. is creating a mycoprotein, so that's fungi protein, that comes from a fermentation platform that allows us to take potatoes, subject them to a fermentation process that within less than one day, less than one day, converts them into a succulent alternative meat. And it really has the texture of meat and we don't have to engage in a lot of post-processing activity or excuse me, post-harvest processing activity. So what we can do essentially, once the fermentation is done, remove it from the fermenter, squeeze out the water, and that's the product. You know, that's the, the dewatering is the only post-harvest process. So, and, and the, the creation there is something that really looks and tastes like meat. So uh, that's what we're doing here at the Better Meat Co. is trying to create the next generation of alternative meat products so that producers of these foods don't have to just rely on plants like soy or wheat or pea, but they can actually rely on a whole food fermentation process that is succulent, delicious, and very sustainable. Beautiful. So through this fermentation process, you're taking carbohydrates essentially and converting them to protein by giving them as a feedstock to the mushrooms to be able to transform, transform the whole process. Yeah, kind of. So like, if you imagine like a cow eats grass and makes steak, right? So our little microscopic fungi eat the potatoes, this very starchy food, and then convert it into a high protein food. And so the potatoes themselves might be about 1% protein or so, but by the time our fermentation is finished, they're about 45% protein is the result. So, you know, within less than a day, you're going from a starchy food into a highly proteinaceous food. And now you have a, uh, have a product that you can utilize like meat. Beautiful. So I have to ask you, there's a product called corn. Yeah. Q-U-O-R-N, which yeah. is also a mycoprotein-based product that has been very controversial. In fact, it was banned in Canada. There were people that were trying to get it banned in the U.S. And it is a very innovative um, meat substitute. How does what you're doing compare to that? And what kinds of assurances can you give us? And what can you tell us about the corn controversy? <laughs> All right. Well, first and foremost, let me say that I love corn. I eat it regularly and I think it's a fantastic company. And, and is, remember everybody, it's Q-U-O-R-N. We're not, yes. we're not talking about C-O-R-N. 
Okay. <laughs> no, no, I do like eating corn, C-O-R-N as well. However, Q-U-O-R-N is the name of a British company that sells in lots of countries, including the United States, and it's a fantastic product. Uh, what they did is they took a species of fungi, it's called Fusarium venenatum in Latin, and uh, they subjected to a fermentation which creates a, a kind of meat-like food. Uh, I think it's great. I don't necessarily think it tastes like meat as much as I just think it tastes good. So I think it's kind of like, I, I imagine like, you know, in the world before anybody figured out how to make cow's milk curdle into cheese, right? So people were drinking milk, but nobody had ever thought about brie or gouda or Swiss or cheddar or anything like that, right? And then somebody figures out how you make milk curdle and cheese is invented. It does, cheese doesn't taste like anything else. It's just a new food. You know, cheese was a novel food to humanity in the recent past, you know, only within thousands of years, uh, whereas humanity has a multi hundred thousand year history. So, you know, it, it, on the timeline of humanity, cheese is like a very novel food. And there's not a lot of other categories of totally novel foods, right? Like we're still, you know, pretty much eating fruits, vegetables, grains, nuts, seeds, uh, meat, whatever. But cheese is like this novel category that doesn't taste like anything else. Um, and that's how I view corn. Corn to me doesn't taste really like meat, although it is kind of, it is meat like, um, but it just tastes good. I really like it and it's high in protein. I, I eat it actually pretty regularly. Um, and so I'm, I'm a fan. I also particularly like that it comes in a cardboard box with no plastic packaging. Yes. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. It, it's really like a pleasure for me uh, to, to have that. But anyway, um, the point is that uh, we are different from corn. So oh, wait, corn before you before you move on, uh, mm -hmm. the reason that corn is controversial, in my understanding, which is limited, so perhaps you can enlighten us further, is that certain people had reactions to it where right. it would induce uh, violent vomiting, nausea, uh, anaphylaxis. Um, right allergic reactions. And some people are allergic to fungus. And so, you know, right. they, that what I was reading is that they were not willing to label it a mold. And people have this whole uh, misconception around mold and fungus and mushrooms. Right. And maybe you right. can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, the problem is, you know, people hear that word mold and they think about like what's growing in their bathtub. They don't consider the fact that like the rind on their cheese is a mold that they love eating, right? Like mold is, a, there, there's, there's thousands of species of mold and some of them are widely used in the food industry and they taste great and people love eating them. They're not, you don't call them a mold, but that's what it is. Um, and so the species that uh, corn is using, sure, but, you know, keep in mind, uh, the, there are some people who are allergic to that species of fungi. But way more people are allergic to peanuts than that or to soy than that. Exactly. And so, yeah, like, you know, so, yeah, there is a tiny little fraction of people who are allergic to it and do have these negative reactions. But way more people are allergic to common foods that people have eaten for a while. And, you know, if you have a food allergy, you should avoid that food. Just and look at gluten sensitivity. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, I mean, the number of people avoiding gluten is very high. Um, and it's just, well, I don't know about very high, but compared to the number of people who have any corn sensitivity uh, is high. So I, you know, I think it's much, I think the so-called controversy is much ado about little just because it is such a small number of people in terms of the total population. Now, at the same time, if you have that allergy, you sure as heck shouldn't be eating it. I mean, if you have an allergy to a food, don't eat the food. Um, but you know, for somebody like myself, who not only isn't allergic to it, but actually eats corn many times per week, I, I, I think it's awesome and I love it. So, um, I'm rooting for them. They had a big acquisition, uh, probably 2015. I want to say, uh, they were acquired for like more than 800 million us dollars. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and so they've, you know, they've had a wild ride and they've been very financially successful, um, and, and good for them. You know, it's really awesome. Like the premise of their whole company, the reason they were started was to solve sustainability problems. They thought we could have, you know, a, an indoor growing season that'd be 365 days a year, very small footprint on the land and grow this highly, uh, highly protein, uh, high protein food that people would really like. And they built it into something really amazing. So how um, are they different? Great. So if you think about it like this, Mira, think about how many plants there are that people eat, right? And in this particular case for plant-based meat, you've got soy, you've got wheat, you've got pea. Those are the most common ones. 
Um, you know, but think about how many other plants there are. Well, in the fungi world, there are thousands of species of fungi. And so in the same way that one plant tastes different from another plant or has different protein levels or it grows differently or it has other attributes that are different, in the fungi world, mycoprotein is a catch-all term for any protein you're growing from fungi. Myco is just Latin, M-Y-C-O, it's uh, Latin for fungi. And uh, what we're doing is essentially using a different species. Um, we don't use the same species. Uh, there's not nearly any of those concerns that you were raising with this species. And importantly, no one had consumed the species that they are using like prior to like 1990 or so, right? Like it would just, nobody, no human had really ever consumed it. Um, it was kind of like, geez. It's using. Yeah, that's right. The species, the species that we use has been safely consumed by humans for centuries. Um, it has a it has an ancient tradition actually in Asian cuisine, so there isn't a um, there isn't a parallel in that particular sense. Now the reason that we use it is not just because it has centuries of history of safe use, but also it's extremely meat like. So I believe that our product is more meat like than corn. Um, I think that we make products that people have a really hard time telling the difference between it and meat. And you know, we served our mycoprotein, which we call Riza, that's R-H-I-Z-A. We served it at a local steakhouse here in Sacramento, California, where we're based. And the owner of the steakhouse said, this is the best uh, alternative meat I've ever had. And so I am, uh, I am convinced that you know, we are just in a wild west when it comes to fungi protein right now, because nearly no research has been done cataloging the thousands of species that you can subject to fermentations and create meat-like products with. So, you know, sure, we all know about like white button mushrooms or shiitake, but there is a vast field of fungi out there that has never been studied that don't even produce mushrooms at all. In fact, 90% of fungi species do not produce mushrooms. So the mushroom is like the, it's like the fruit of the fungi, right? So they, you know, the mushroom is, is like the apple on the tree, but all of these fungi are producing the roots in the trunk, even if they don't produce mushrooms. And those are many times very edible, very nutritious and really, really delicious. Uh, so that's how we're different. We're just, you know, just in the same way that, you know, one company might use one crop and the other uses a different crop. We're using a different species and uh, we really like it. So you said that you shared this with the restaurant in Sacramento, and now you've teased all of us to, to who are interested in alternative meat, um, meat products. How do we get what you're creating? How do we get your product? Well, we're bringing it out, Mira. So uh, I, I don't, you know, I don't know when our episode will air, but on August 21st, um, which is probably, um, I imagine your episode will air after that, but on August 21st, um, 2021 folks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very good point. Very good point. So eight twenty one twenty one, we are going to have an, a steakhouse called Bennett's American grill will be serving steaks made from our rise of mycoprotein. So that'll be, um, you know, really great experiment to see how it goes. And I think that people will really like it. We'll take the feedback and learn how people are enjoying it and get, you know, get continual improvement. The benefit for what we're doing is that, you know, cows are just not going to get any better, right? Like a cow today is not that different from a cow 10 or 20 years ago. Whereas our product can continually evolve because we can rapidly iterate on it using different ingredients, different styles of fermentation and so on to continue making the product better and better. And so that will be uh, test number one, and then we'll be rolling it out further and wider after that. Now, my understanding is that you've set up your company as a B2B company. So you're not going to be creating a retail product such as corn that we would be able to buy directly. Is that true? That's right. Our plan is to be a B2B ingredients provider to other companies. So we sell ingredients to other companies who put it into their products and they go market and formulate it and, and all that. So imagine like, you know, if you think about like the gold rush, most people who rushed for gold didn't make any money, but the people who sold them the shovels and the pickaxes, they did make money. And that's what we're going for as well. There are hundreds of startups in the alternative protein space right now. Most of them will not survive. And we are essentially going to be a provider to a lot of these companies and to big food companies too, to ensure that we have a unique ingredient that uh, lots of people will want to utilize. Something that I thought was so interesting that you told me is that a number of existing meat companies are going to be your customers as well. And they'll be using your product, the RISA, to supplement or augment the meat 
that they're producing to blend it together. How does that work? Sure. So if you think about it, like actually think about this, like right now at Burger King, they have the impossible Whopper. It's awesome. It's really historic that they have a plant-based burger at Burger King. Um, and so I'm very enthusiastic about that, but the, the impossible Whopper, according to news reports at most is about 2% of the burger sales there at most. And imagine though, if in addition to serving the impossible Whopper, Burger King also took its conventional Whopper and made it 50% plant-based. So now instead of a 2% reduction in, in beef consumption, you're getting a 50% reduction because the default product has less meat in it. That is the promise of blending. And so in the same way, when you go, for example, Mira, to fill up your car with gas, you don't really even contemplate the fact that it's at least 10% ethanol. You don't even think about it. Like you don't even contemplate, you just put gas in your car and that's it. And we want to make hybridization of meat the norm so that it is just the default option that when you get meat, it doesn't necessarily have to be entirely made from the slaughtered animal, that it can also contain protein from plants or protein from microbes, et cetera. So I really believe that hybridization is gonna be a big part of the future of meat and it'll be a big part of sustainability and helping to bring down uh, demand for meat without having to persuade people simply to stop eating meat. I think it'll be an interesting PR uh, adventure to see how these companies would market something when they've been touting 100% beef, 100% yeah. pure beef, you know, USDA, whatever. Yeah, I, I think solely beef or solely meat is going to be something that's viewed as inferior. Right. So in the same way, like, let's say you go to Jamba Juice and they ask, hey, do you want to boost your smoothie with matcha or hemp seeds or whatever else? Like you don't perceive yourself as getting less smoothie. You perceive yourself as getting a better smoothie. It's, a, it's now an enhanced smoothie, right? Your parent, you probably pay more to get those things in there because you think of it as better. Well, I think similarly, something that's solely meat, that's no good. That's like the least of what you want. You want something that's enhanced that has other things. So keep in mind, just as one example, meat has no fiber. No species of meat has any fiber at all in it. And 97% of Americans are fiber deficient. You know where you get fiber? From plants. Um, you know, plants don't have skeletons and so they have fiber to hold them up. That's why you have fiber in the plant and you don't have fiber in animals. Well, in almost nobody in America is protein deficient. Almost nobody, you probably have never met a protein deficient person, yet nearly everybody you meet is fiber deficient because people don't eat enough whole fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, right? They just aren't eating enough of those uh, healthy foods. And so if people aren't going to switch to, you know, let's say uh, fruits and vegetables, well, at least we can put some fiber in the meat itself through, by blending it with, um, with healthy plant foods and it looks and tastes the same as a conventional burger, but instead of just being a solely meat burger, now it's an enhanced burger. Well, now I'm thinking about the, the meat production companies. Um, I imagine they have a pretty strong lobbying arm. <laughs> yeah, you imagine correctly. Yeah, so I don't imagine that they'd be so thrilled with the enhanced meat idea. And, I, and it's interesting, you know, like in making these changes from fossil fuel, for instance, to alternative energy fuel and, and from uh, meat to more plant-based food, I think that one of the things that we're confronting is the political machine that is working so hard to keep things in place for these companies that are so deeply entrenched and, and powerful uh, economically and politically. What, what are you imagining around that or what are you aware of around that? This is one of the reasons, Mira, that I think that these meat companies need to become part of a solution now rather than digging their feet in the sand. So, you know, think about it like this. So if you go back, um, you know, to the 1990s, all there was like this big war between Kodak and Canon. They were vying for supremacy in the film market and digital film comes around and Kodak is concerned that it's going to cannibalize their core business so they don't pursue it. Canon, though, says you know, we think it's the future, so they embrace it. And we know what happened in the end. So Kodak goes bankrupt, and Canon is now the largest manufacturer of digital cameras on the planet. And yes, there are some meat companies that are like the Kodaks out there, but there are a lot of them that are like the Canon. And they realize that the future of protein is not going to be just slaughtered animals, that it is also going to entail all these more sustainable, more humane types of protein. And they want to be a part of that future of a more diverse portfolio of protein out there. And so it's really imperative, I think, that we get these meat companies on board and have them diversify their own offerings so they aren't so wedded to fighting. 
Uh, you know, if they are at threat, then they will fight. But if they have an opportunity to actually make some money here by using fewer animals, that's great. So, you know, for so long, it's been profitable to damage the, the, the planet. What if we can make it profitable to do less harm to the planet? That would be really amazing. Uh, so I, I want to see the meat companies getting involved in the plant-based and other alternative protein spaces, because I think that uh, for a variety of reasons, one of which is that they won't fight so hard against this future. So it's the same strategy for fossil fuel companies is to be getting them involved in producing alternative energies. They already have the money. They already have the motivation and it's, it's the writing's on the wall. So yeah, right. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Adapt yeah, you or not. Make sure that it's real, that it's not just lip service. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. But I want to circle back around because you were talking about Burger King and, and Impossible Foods and these other meat substitutes that are on the market. Um, it is possible to buy Beyond Meat. Um, and I know that there's a comparison between Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods. Uh, Impossible Foods, from my understanding, is um, the meat is made primarily from soy and soy is largely GMO. And uh, there are lots and lots and lots of people who are vegetarian and vegan are very conscientious about the sourcing of their of the food that they're eating and and with impossible food and even with uh, beyond meat beyond meat the packaging like you said you enjoyed the fact that corn comes in paper packaging with no plastic whereas uh, the Beyond Meat packaging and a lot of these other meat substitutes is in a plastic form container that is not recyclable with with film plastic that is not recyclable in another plastic container. You know, it's just insane. It's insane to me that companies that are doing something where their market is so largely uh, conscientious or aware of of um the, our impact on the planet would be packaging this alternative product in in unrecyclable planet damaging packaging it just makes no sense to me so yeah i, I can't speak to that i don't know what the what the story is with that um but uh you know i look at hamburger so you know if you buy their like the, a pound of let's say like beyond beef right that's not the case it does come in a, a plastic wrapper but it's not all the plastic that you were just talking about okay. when you buy when you buy preformed patties then it does come in like a hard plastic shell to maintain the shape right. of that patty and yeah. that's a concern however their sausage uh the beyond sausage i've noticed is basically looks like a, a compostable type of uh thing with a little like almost like saran wrap type packaging over it so it is, uh, that seems pretty uh, better from a lack of um, plastic perspective. But yeah, I mean, look, you know, there's no doubt that just eating whole foods, like whole fruits and vegetables and grains uh, is better for us and the planet than eating processed foods. However, you know, I, I would be thrilled to eat, you know, bean and brown rice burritos and lentil soup and hummus. I love those foods, but I think a lot of people want meat. You know, I hate to say it. I wish it weren't true, but I think a lot of people just want meat and we got to provide it to them somehow. So I don't know how to get around this issue. I share your concern about it. Again, it's one of the reasons why I like corn, although I also like it because I think it's a great tasting product. Um, but I, I share your concern on this. And, and probably the answer is in creating plastics that either will biodegrade um, or have some other, you know, environmental benefit. You know, um, for my podcast, The Business for Good Podcast, I recently interviewed um, a company called Radical Plastics that has basically invented a way where you can make plastic the same way you make it today, but less than 1% of the plastic has this mineral compound that they put in there. So at the point of manufacture, that actually renders it biodegradable. So yeah. you don't need to switch entirely, let's say, to like, you know, PLA or something, but rather just make plastic what you do, but you put a little tiny amount of this mineral in there and it actually renders it something that... Uh, soil microbes can see as food. And so then they eat it and it degrades. So that might be one answer to that. Um, but I think it'll require, you know, interesting technologies to solve the plastic problem, which is an enormous problem. Well, thank you. So I also want to find out, back to the comparison of impossible foods to Beyond Meat to, um, to Better Meat Co. Are you, are you certified as organic? 
Sure. So uh, to answer your question earlier about us, we don't use genetically modified organisms. We do a, a natural fermentation with a natural uh, species of fungi that um, you know, grows into a, a meat-like product, which is great. Um, so organic is a, a very highly regulated term. I would say we are better than organic. We are, are not only, you know, we don't have the certification from USDA on this, um, but we're better than organic. So, you know, oftentimes what we do is, you, you know, you have to feed the, the, the microbes, right? So, you know, we feed them, like I said, potatoes. Well, you know, we oftentimes utilize just byproducts from the industry, whether, you know, we've used a lot of different agricultural byproducts, not just in the potato industry, but other industries too. And we can actually make our, uh, our meat from byproducts. So that's better than organic. That's not having to use any new land at all to farm because you're just taking foods that would have been thrown out or maybe gone into like low grade cattle feed and so on. So that's the, the real holy grail for us is upcycling uh, these waste streams rather than switching to new products that are organic. Well, now you said low grade uh, animal feed products. Right. So imagine in the rice. Are, let, let me just interrupt for a second. Those are often created with vast amounts of glyphosate and all kinds of other chemical fertilizers and pesticides and fungicides. And so well, what yeah, happens? These, these yeah. are the same. These are the same foods that humans are eating. So, you know, let me just give you an example. I know, but that's it's really so a problem. Right. So when let's say when, you know, you harvest a field of rice and there are little broken pieces of that rice. Oftentimes, you know, they're not going to be sold because, you know, you know fewer, few consumers want to buy broken rice. And so that will oftentimes be considered like a low-grade animal feed. It will go just that rice. So it's the same exact rice. It's just the grain was broken. Uh, and so we can utilize that as a source of nutrition for our fermentation. Similarly with potatoes, when potatoes are too small, um, or when there are, uh, you know, miscuts for the French fries, or if there are defects in the potatoes, uh, they're not going to make it to, you know, let's say, uh, you know, a fast food restaurant's uh, French fry uh, so, uh, stream, but they still have some nutrition and that all gets sold to like, you know, either it gets landfilled or it gets sold, you know, for very cheap to um, animal feed. And we can utilize that. So what we're doing is taking food that has already been grown and that would be either thrown out or used as animal feed and subjecting it to a fermentation that makes a really high quality product. So, you know, that's better than growing anything new for us, for sure. Like upcycling is better for the planet because we're not requiring any new land to be farmed. I agree with you 100 percent, but I don't know that I could characterize it as better than organic, especially because you have a lot of chemical additives that are part right. of the growing process in many of these feedstocks. And so, sure. well, well, I think it's a, I do think it's helpful to remember that organic doesn't mean no pesticides. It just means no synthetic pesticides. So or, organic farmers are, are still using pesticides. And the difference between synthetic and natural pesticides or synth, uh, synthetic and organic pesticides is not always better in terms of toxicity. Sometimes the organic ones can even be uh, more uh, deadly to the insect, let's say. And so I'm all with you. I mean, I'm, I, have, I share your concerns about the, uh, the rampant use of pesticides because I, I think it's terrible for the environment. I'm not so sure that, um, you know, the, the organic versus synthetic pesticide issue though is necessarily so clear cut because sometimes the organic pesticides can actually be pretty potent. So I guess really the question that I have for you is, do you have any evidence as to whether the fermentation process mitigates the chemicals? I, like what kind of nutritional pro profile do you have for, for the end product? That's a great question, Mira. So we have ample nutritional information showing that the product is higher in protein than eggs. It's higher in iron than beef. It naturally contains vitamin B12. It's super high in fiber. In fact, more fiber than oats. Um, and it really does a great job of converting one thing to another. Like that's what fermentation does is you're converting one thing to another. And it does a great job of, of doing that and making a product that really is succulent and meat-like. And um, it, I don't make the case that it is a panacea to all of the woes of our current agribusiness system. I do make the case that compared to eating meat from animals, that it is a dramatically better product. 
So have you done any kind of testing to identify chemical residues, for instance, from pesticides and we, we have, yeah, we have done a number of tests to look at things like, uh, you know, whether it be lead or arsenic or other types of problems that you can have. Um, and we've always been within uh, uh, safe limits for sure. Um, but I, I will say, you know, uh, there are some crops like, for example, brown rice, uh, which is brown rice, um, even organic brown rice that happens to be grown in certain parts of the country like Arkansas and, and other parts of the South where they used to use a lot of arsenic containing pesticides on that land. Um, you know, rice is really good at taking up uh, arsenic. And so even just eating brown rice on its own actually has pretty high levels of arsenic and there's no limits on how much arsenic can be in your food. We have limits on how much arsenic can be in water, but there's no limits on how much can be in food because it uptakes it from the soil. And so anyway, like even something like organic brown rice, which you would think is like this really healthy natural food, it could actually have dangerously high levels of arsenic at some times if it's just pending. Now I'm not saying all brown rice is that way, but you can have that problem. So, you know, the tests that we've done have shown that we're always within the safe limits on, on these issues. Um, but depending on where crops are grown, you never know like what's in the soil. And so you have to be vigilant and continually test. I guess one of the reason what I'm really trying to get to is what, what transformation is occurring in the chemical makeup of your feedstock as it's converted to the rhiza. Because yeah. I know that mushrooms have a great capacity to do remediation. They do. Yeah, it's amazing, and actually. It's miraculous because um, Paul Stamets has, uh, I'm sure you're quite familiar with Paul Stamets, but he's researched so many different arenas uh, related to mushrooms and what their capacities are. And they have been used to remediate radioactivity, to uh, remediate toxic spills, all kinds of um, amazing things. And I'm wondering in this fermentation process, are you aware of transformation of any of these toxic chemicals that might then no longer be in the final product? It's a great question, Mira. I don't know the answer to it. I don't think that we have actually um, studied that particular issue in depth, but you raising it with me now makes me want to study it. So you can bet that we will be looking into it. That's exciting. I'm glad you will. And, and I, I love that you're blazing trails. And I also really love that you have the podcast um, and I, and before we wrap up, I, I want to ask you, what is the most mind blowing business that you have encountered for your podcast, uh, for somebody really making a profound difference in the world? Well, I don't want to, I've done like uh, about 75 or so episodes, so I don't want to just pick one who's the most mind blowing, but I'll pick one that I'm actually particularly fascinated by, which is, you know, you have this problem of nuclear storage that, you know, nuclear is a type of energy that does not generate greenhouse gas emissions, but you have this really serious problem that you have all this like, you know, highly uh, dangerous uh, material that is going to be dangerous for millennia. And what do you do with it? And so uh, there's this one uh, company called Deep Isolation, and they have figured out a way to essentially uh, safely store deep underground nuclear waste. And, you know, even if we didn't do any more nuclear uh, power right now, we still have massive amounts of nuclear waste in hundreds of locations all around the world that has to be safely disposed of. So even if you don't like nuclear power, um, which is a separate matter altogether, but even if you don't like it, we need to do something with all this nuclear waste that's just sitting around. And so uh, one of the issues is that um, it's against federal law in the United States to, for any private company to, uh, permanently dispose of nuclear waste. So the question is, how do you then, if you can't permanently dispose of nuclear waste, how can you then dispose of it in a way that's safe, that makes it retrievable, so it's not permanent, right? And this company has pioneered a method of storing it deep underground where you can still retrieve it. And that would mean that, you know, you can retrieve it should we ever want, so we ever in the future figure out ways to actually do something with it, like remediate it or maybe mine it for other new materials that are in there or something like that. And so I thought that was so cool that they're trying to solve this problem and they figured out a way around the federal law uh, to legally dispose of nuclear waste in a way that is both safe and advantageous for the future. Brilliant, brilliant. So how 
can people find, I know that you have multiple websites, so I'm going to give you an opportunity to do some shameless plugs and we'll make <laughs> for, for all your uh, properties on our website. So go That's for right. it. That's very nice of you, Mira. So if you're interested in the Better Meat Co., just visit us at bettermeat.co. Again, that's bettermeat.co. And if you're interested in my book, Clean Meat, you can just go to the website, cleanmeat.com. Again, that's cleanmeat.com. And I'd love to hear from you. If you're interested in joining us or if you're interested in supporting us or if you're interested in working together in some way to make the world a better place, I want to hear from you. So you can get in touch with me via any, either of those websites and I look forward to hearing from you. And also your podcast. We want to plug that too. Oh, thank you, Mary. Yeah, so businessforgoodpodcast.com. Again, that's businessforgoodpodcast.com. And check out these episodes. You can learn about really inspirational companies doing things to make the world a better place. Beautiful. And so what should I have asked you that I didn't ask you, Paul? Uh, you know, Mira, you didn't ask me about my amazing, amazing dog, Eddie, and I'm going to plug him <laughs> here because if you were to look at a pie chart of the happiness in my life, uh, my wife and dog would be very high on the list, um, but Eddie is particularly uh, welfare enhancing to me. And so if you like your welfare enhanced and you would enjoy seeing all the photos and videos of Eddie's exploits, he is an Instagram celebrity and you can visit him at Instagram at Eddie the Pity. That's E-D-D-I-E, -E, the P-I-T-T-I-E, -T -T -E, Eddie the Pity. So he could be the <laughs> yeah, yes, he is definitely well, a pimp. Show your shirt, Paul. Yes, and so for those of you watching this, instead of listening to it, if you look at my shirt here, I have a nice Hawaiian shirt with Eddie's face emblazoned all over it. I'm a big fan of his. He's a very close friend of mine, and uh, I'm I'm glad to tout his his popularity. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you so much, Paul, and thank you for really being such a visionary and, and taking action in so many different areas. I, I think what you're doing with Better Meat Co. is remarkable. And the thing is, I really believe in the power of podcasts. That what's, that's what this is all about, is really spreading the word and educating people to alternatives. And I think what you're doing with that is brilliant as well. So much, much gratitude to you. I'm grateful to you, Mira, for giving a platform to people who are trying to improve humanity's sustainable relationship with the planet. And I'm really happy to be talking with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you who are listening. We so appreciate you and you carrying the torch and spreading the word. And I want to say thank you also to my partner in crime here at Sustainability Now, uh, Scott Billy, who is also our producer. And until next time. Live your best life, love the world around you, and together we can save the world. Thank you for listening to Sustainability Now, solutions to shape a world that works. Visit sustainabilitynow.global for resources related to today's program. And be sure to subscribe, share, and follow us on social media.